Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about the incredible mission from asteroid Bennu that essentially finally retrieved the sample that's going to be returning to Earth now. But I also wanted to talk about the idea of different types of sample retrievals from the past missions and what we were able to learn from them as well. In other words, let's do a bit of a history trip and discover what the humanity was able to achieve in the last few decades. But first, let's also discuss the tiny trouble that the mission actually just uh, finished solving that unfortunately started right here during the process of retrieval when the probe accidentally collected too much sample, unfortunately preventing it from shutting its internal doors and the scientists had to, for approximately two days, actively try to resolve all of this by manually launching several important commands and forcing it to prematurely store the samples in the return capsule, because if they hadn't done so, unfortunately, they would most likely lose all of the samples. But it looks like now they've finally achieved it, and the mission is probably going to be a success after all. And honestly, this so far has been an incredibly stressful time for a lot of the scientists behind this mission, especially because it takes approximately 18 minutes for the light to reach this probe, meaning that for every single command you send here, it takes about 18 minutes for the signal to reach the probe, for it to do something, and then it will take 18 and a half minutes more for the probe to send the signal back, essentially telling the scientist if it was a success or a failure. So this was a pretty stressful and also extremely challenging mission, because essentially during this process when the probe was supposed to retrieve the samples, instead of just getting approximately 60 grams or so of material, way too much material was received, which caused a major problem for the scientists as the doors were unable to close and the sample was continuously lost to space. And the preliminary calculations suggest that approximately 400 grams of samples were retrieved, although we're not actually going to know how much of the sample we have in there until the probe returns to Earth and until we open the canister. And all of this is happening in a few years from now, three years as a matter of fact. The capsule is going to return back to Earth in uh, 2023, and this part right here is going to be landing in the desert in Utah, returning the extremely precious cargo hopefully landing correctly and not destroying the sample on the way, because that's kind of what happened to one of the probes in the past. The picture that you see right here was taken back in 2004, and this is the unfortunate Genesis probe. The incredible NASA probe that was essentially the first time ever we were able to collect samples from beyond the moon. And the idea here was pretty simple. Launch something past the moon's orbit, and use these very unique collectors to try to collect as much interstellar dust and interplanetary dust as possible by essentially having the probe travel across the planetary space. But it didn't really go that far, as a matter of fact it mostly just stayed in the Lagrange point of our planet, approximately one and a half million kilometers away. And the idea was then to use a helicopter to try to capture the probe as it slowly descended in our atmosphere with a parachute. But it just so happens that the parachute unfortunately failed, and the probe ended up crashing in the region of Utah Desert where, well, technically the OSIRIS-REx mission is going to be landing as well. Luckily for us though, as you can see in this picture, some of the samples were actually still retrievable. This is uh, one of the investigators, Donald Burnett, who was able to retrieve a lot of the samples and many of them were still quite useful for different scientific investigations. And a lot of the discoveries made as a result of this were mostly related to the sun itself. Like for example, the scientists discovered that for some reason our sun seems to possess a little bit more oxygen-16 than for example planet Earth, which to scientists suggested that something must be decreasing the amount of this type of oxygen in our planet and of course other planets in comparison to our sun. Now this is still a mystery, we haven't really been able to answer it, but it's probably a mystery that we're going to be able to answer at some point in the future. But when it comes to robotic retrieval missions, meaning that humans were not involved in retrieving those samples, this was the pioneer. This was back in 1970, and this was the Soviet Luna 16 mission that was able to autonomously retrieve samples from the moon, thus initiating the age of robotic retrieval from around the solar system. And in mid-90s, Soviets also had a very interesting retrieval mission on the Mir station, which doesn't actually exist anymore because it was um, decommissioned and it fell somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. But essentially, the Russian scientists had a kind of an aerogel attached to the station that in a nutshell kind of looks like this. And aerogel is really good at retrieving different samples because it's able to capture materials and store them safely for a very long time. 
which is actually exactly what NASA is doing today as well in the International Space Station with the mission known as Stardust. The purpose of all of these missions is to try to collect as much interstellar dust as possible, but this time within the uh, sort of region around planet Earth. And then we have this other mission from a comet, and this was a NASA mission from a comet known as VILT-2, which quite unexpectedly back in 1974 changed its orbit when it passed really close to Jupiter. Its orbit changed from about 43 years to about 6 years, and so it was much easier for NASA to try to reach this comet and to study it in detail. And so in 1999 NASA decided to launch a Stardust spacecraft that you see right here, although here's a more realistic picture with two scientists for comparison, which performed a major flyby of this comet in 2004, analyzing and also documenting a lot of the surface features, and of course collecting some of the samples from the cometary tail as well. And the samples were then successfully returned to planet Earth and allowed us to discover some really unusual things about this comet and to some extent about other comets as well. For some reason, this comet contained a lot of minerals that are usually created in very hot conditions, with also potential signs that liquid water existed on this comet at some point in the past. All of this meant that at some point this comet was probably really really warm, possibly even very hot with one potential explanation being that it was either due to collisions with other objects, or maybe we just don't really understand the protoplanetary disk as well as we think we did. Either way, the mysteries from this comet still haven't really been resolved. At the same time, it allowed us to see different activities on this comet, including several major eruptions and at least 10 different gas vents that were active during the flyby of this comet. In other words, it allowed the scientists to study the actual activity of comets and what causes all of these different tails to be created. And by the way, this was also the other time when we actually discovered glycine somewhere else out there, that very very common amino acid that's present in our bodies and has also been recently found on Venus, was also discovered in this comet as well. In other words, glycine is actually pretty common out there, but we just haven't really been able to find it on many planets. But to date, one of the most successful and one of the most interesting sample retrieval missions was this right here, the probe that does actually resemble OSIRIS-REx from NASA, at least in terms of the shapes and the locations of solar panels. This was the Japanese Hayabusa-1 mission, which returned the samples back to Earth back in 2010, but originally retrieved the samples from the asteroid known as Itokawa back in 2005. And this mission was a resounding success for Japan because this was their first attempt and they succeeded beyond their expectations. This was also an attempt to test ion engines because this is what the probe used to navigate and it was also extremely successful. And because this was the first ever asteroid retrieval mission, it also allowed us to collect samples we've never had before, allowing the scientists to discover that first of all this asteroid seemed to have been a part of a much larger asteroid, in other words it may have separated from a larger piece during for example a collision or some sort of a separation event, but most importantly it allowed Japanese scientists to test various technologies in terms of retrieval, in terms of propulsion, and establishing a lot of interesting techniques that were later used in other missions including OSIRIS-REx. And here is an interesting footage showing the return of the capsule as it enters the Earth's atmosphere, and you'll see how it starts to break up and to turn into a very large fireball, which is usually what happens when objects that are man-made return back to Earth. Now the capsule itself survived and everything was just fine, but this is essentially what usually happens when these events occur. But as you might already know, Japanese scientists have also launched Hayabusa 2, the second version of the mission. And unlike NASA's mission, this one is going to be coming back to Earth in December of 2020, and so if you're watching this in the future, it might have already come back and we might already be studying the samples. In other words, Japanese are once again sort of ahead of NASA and have managed to achieve another successful retrieval without any major glitches or without any major problems in the process. And so in the next few months, we're probably going to be discovering some incredible new things about this particular asteroid known as Asteroid Ryugu which has also been known as the most likely source of future mining operations if we ever decide to do any kind of a space mining as well. And so for now that's kind of all we know about these different missions and until December of 2020 we're probably not going to have any major updates. The NASA's mission is going to start returning home most likely in early 2021 and it's not going to come back here for at least a few years. 
Nevertheless, all of these missions are really exciting, especially because they both allow us to study these different objects, but at the same time are also taking us closer and closer to new discoveries and new abilities, specifically abilities to mine these objects sometime in the future. And I bet Japan is going to be way ahead of the game when it comes to mining asteroids, at least in the next few decades. But anyway, until we discover more about the samples or until something else happens with the mission, that's kind of all I wanted to mention in this video. Thank you so much for watching, subscribe if you still haven't and share this with someone who loves to learn about space and sciences and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something you may have not known before. Also maybe support this channel on Patreon or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. And either way, I'll see you tomorrow, space out and as always, bye bye.